this Bible reading has got a lot in it. Um, Parable of the Good Samaritan, but it's also got those wonderful words uh, that we always say about being a Christian, to love God and to love your neighbour as yourself. So um, Luke 10, 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any expense you have made, uh, that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. We come to that parable and uh, what happens around it. So let's, as before we do, let's take a moment, let's pray together. Gracious God, as we hear these words again of Jesus, as we uh, contemplate them again, may they be not just words that were spoken 2,000 years ago, but words that live in us, that call us into a new enactment of our relationship with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not a fan when someone answers your question by ans asking another question. Does anybody love that? I imagine not. Like when in a lecture, you know, you ask a question and the lecturer says, so what do you think? I don't know what I think because I just asked you a question. But all that aside, it is a really effective teaching tool. I have used it myself and I apologise for everybody I've done that with. It does strengthen the, the education process as we work it through for ourselves. Today, in the story of the telling of this parable, Jesus does it too. So let's revisit that. First of all, we have an expert in the law, a lawyer, if you like. I'm sorry to all the lawyers, but as a recovering accountant, uh, my recollection was that lawyers were trying to work out where the limits are so they can do, get away with all they possibly could while still obeying the law. This guy is no different. He asked Jesus, so Jesus stands up. What should I do to inherit e eternal life? And that's interesting on a couple of points. First of all, he's an expert of the law. So he knows the answer as is evidenced. They took, he tells him, Jesus asked him and he tells him. So he's kind of checking up on Jesus at the same time. The second thing is he assumes that there is eternal life. It's interesting because not all Jews believe that at the time. He's checking up on Jesus. And he assumes that it exists. And thirdly, he's not just happy to stay seated. He stands up. He knows he is someone of authority in that particular conversation. So Jesus asks him what he thinks. And the lawyer trots out exactly what Jesus believes as he also explains it at that capitulation, as the capitulation of the law and the prophets. If you look at Mark 12, 29, he says exactly the same thing himself. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourselves. Jesus says that if he does these things, life is his. But wanting to know the limits, as a lawyer does, he asks, so who is my neighbour? And so Jesus tells the story. There's a man and he walks from Jerusalem down to Jericho. It's literally down. It's down from a mountain. And he's walking down to Jericho. It's about 17 miles uh, in the old speak uh, from Jerusalem to to Jericho. Not very far in car. Not so great if you're walking. It's pretty hilly. It's pretty craggy. And there there are plenty of rocky outcrops for robbers just to lurk in there and, uh, and hide behind them. Probably everybody listening, you've someone who'd been robbed out there. Anyway, there are robbers there and they see the man and they seize the opportunity. They rob him, they beat him up, they strip him and they leave him for dead. They are absolutely merciless. And while he lies there, three different people walk by. First one, a priest. This is a good guy. He helps people to be right with God, helps them to present their sacrifices. Surely he would help. But for a priest to touch this man, particularly if he happened to be dead, that's going to make him unclean. He may not be able to perform those rites. And so he he values that role more than looking after the man. And so he crosses the road, and he walks on by. And then a Levite, another person from a, from a priestly tribe, probably someone who helped in the temple or helped, uh, helped doing religious duties during the week. Again, probably didn't want to get involved for much the same reasons. He just wanted to get to the temple. So again, passes on the other, on the other side, keeps on going. They both see this person. They cross out of the way to avoid him. Just like the robbers, these good guys of the Jewish society just leave this person for dead. Not much better than the robbers, really. And then we have a Samaritan. You probably know what a Samaritan's like. A little bit even more than crows versus Port Adelaide. (coughs) Jews and Samaritans are not friends. They had no respect for each other, really, and would prefer to uh, to shout insults at each other rather than ever lift a finger to help. The Jews were the continuing bloodline of the the Jews who had entered Canaan uh, right back to the time of Joshua, with some hangers on as well. For Samaria, while they started out with a Jewish bloodline, they were taken over by Assyria, and Assyria's way of invading a country was to cart everybody off to Assyria and then mix them all up and then send back a bunch of people, no matter where they were from, from that previous land. According to the Jews, they had lost the purity of their bloodline. They weren't really Jews anymore. They were just pretenders. Compound that with ages of finding fault with one another and it's a serious issue. But this Samaritan does. He does stop. He does what all the others haven't done. He checks on him. He sees his condition and his state. And he takes the victim as his own concern. He assumes responsibility for him. He uses his own oil and wine. Known ways of healing wounds back in the day. But valuable commodities nonetheless. He sacrifices his own donkey to let the man be carried the distance to the next town. And there he stops. He stops at the inn. And he pays two days, basically two de- what would normally be two days wages to the innkeeper to look after that victim. With the promises that he will return to check on the man and pay any extra necessary to ensure that he will have every opportunity to recover, to start healing, to be well again in a safe place. 
Jesus then asks the lawyer, who was that man's neighbour? Well, the one who had mercy on him, of course. And then Jesus command, go and do likewise. There's a bunch of ways in which this parable gets applied at different times. I've heard a lot of them. Be nice to everybody. You never know what you're going to get. Get back. Uh, you never know who will be good, uh, good to you. So look after everyone because, you know, it's, it's for your best benefit. And while they're good things to say out of this parable, I really think Jesus had another idea. As I said before, this expert in the law had already told Jesus quite rightly what it would take to receive eternal life. That is, what it would take to be right before God. But he wanted to know what those limits were. He wanted to know how little he could get away with. When he could know he'd actually done enough. But when Jesus told the parable, what he was actually telling the lawyer was that he was asking the wrong question. He had got it the wrong way around. If you think about the three people who passed the man lying by the side of the road, who would the man have thought was his neighbour? Probably the priest or the Levite. Not only were they supposedly the good guys of society, They lived in the same culture. They travelled the same road. They might have even lived in the same place. Surely the proximity of relationship, while not close, would have at least been tangible. But the Samaritan, his roots were somewhere else entirely, in another culture, another people. He would be the last person that this man lying there, if he could think, would be his neighbour. But Jesus shares that another way. The other two, they saw the man. They looked at him. They knew he was there. This person who was perhaps even from their own village. But on seeing him, they move to the other side of the road. They consciously get out of the way and keep on going. They know he is in need, but they won't stop to help That road is a chasm that they are unwilling to breach. They spend, to spend any time, any effort, any expense to help this man dying on the side of the road. It would have been better if they hadn't seen him at all. But this Samaritan, he dismounts from his donkey. He comforts and tends the man's wounds. With no thought to the expense, he walks to the next town to provide him with food, with lodging, and maybe someone to check on him, paying us half a week's wages to do it. Whatever he was travelling to do, he was put to one side entirely while he cares for this man. Just think about it. Let's say you were travelling and you saw someone by the side of the road, beaten up, lying there, needing help. Would you stop your car? Would you tend to him? Then take him to a hotel and pay for his lodging and help him uh, so he can recover. Expenses paid. (laughs) And then come back tomorrow to see how how he's going. It's incredibly generous, even in today's world. But rather than just being a person's rescuer, it's more than that. In that moment, a relationship forms. He is more than rescue. He becomes a neighbour. Let me give you another example. Just a couple of weeks ago here, uh, a Chinese lady, a lady, lady, her name Bonnie, uh, came here. Uh, just came to church. She felt really, really welcome. So many people greeted her and she felt uh, really well welcomed here. So well done. Great job. Uh, Tina particularly took uh, took an interest to uh, just start to see what she needed and started helping her. And a little friendship has started to grow, and which is wonderful. And Tina is now thinking out of this kindness, out of this generosity, what it is, uh, how she can also introduce Bonnie to Jesus. And she is interested in it. It's just a... It, 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 she didn't even need to stop 
and take time. But if through this, something new is germinating, a relationship, an opportunity for something more. I can give you other examples. There are people who have served here for so long. There are people on the roster, people who help here at so many other different programs that we run. Uh, and then there was Noel helping uh, Trevor and Jan move the other week, which is just a wonderful thing. And the many others who've helped them pick up, pack up as well, I understand. The whole team at Message at Five, oh my goodness, that's a massive concern. Not concerning, just massive. <laughs> so much that people give, not out of obligation, but because of what God has already given them. And they are nice things to do for anyone, but. Why, as Christians, should we take this so seriously? Why? Because it was done first for us. And it was done out of the Father's endless love. He stopped at nothing to deal with our rebellion and the results of that against him. To bring us back into his kingdom, into his family, into his uh, ongoing sons and uh, into the no, uh, into his own offspring. We're told in Romans five that you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Just think about that. Christ, the Son of God, died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We hadn't even apologised. And yet God allowed Jesus to die for us. We are compelled because Christ did it for us. Christ didn't wait for us to move into his neighbourhood. He just loved us first. So rather than asking who was our neighbour, let's start the right way around. Who might we be a neighbour to? What are we prepared to give of ourselves to be a neighbour? To make a neighbour? Would it be through introducing a person to Jesus? Or perhaps making the effort to talk to someone on Sunday rather than let them rush out the door? Or perhaps supporting people like Martin and Bina over in Goa as they continue their work with the people over there. Our neighbours are an endless possibility if we are prepared to make a way to meet them, motivated by the God who met us first. So something to think about as you talk about over morning tea. Who might be your next neighbour? And what might be your first step? Let's pray. Gracious God, as we come here today, we know we are loved. We know we are loved by a God who has stopped at nothing for that to be the case. Lord, there are so many people in this world who do not know that love. Perhaps even they do not know love. Lord, we have an opportunity, but more than that, we are compelled, not out of obligation, but because you loved us first and you have never stopped and you never will. May we love like that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.